Hello, I'm Reggie Young. I'm here with Dustin Kane. Dustin, if you could take a quick second to explain a little bit about who you are, where you got started, and what you're up to. For sure. Yeah. How much time you got? <laughs> I'll try to <laughs> be. Time. I'll try to be uh, brief, and then we can go on. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Dustin Kane. I'm excited to be uh, on your podcast. Uh, we certainly enjoyed having you on our podcast uh, not too long ago. It was a blast. Um, but a little bit about me. I. Um, I'm a former tennis player. That was my career. For, you can see the rackets behind me. If you're watching, <laughs> you're listening, I got some old school rackets behind me, but I was, uh, uh, for years I played college tennis. And then after that got into, uh, the teaching side of tennis. So I was a tennis professional at clubs in, uh, Tennessee, which is where I went to college and uh, did that for almost 18 years, um, full time. That was my job. So, um, you know, getting out of of college, you know, I was graduated with business, got my MBA and I, you know, I just, I've always been sort of a entrepreneurial spirit. Um, so it's like, <clears throat> I just can't go get a corporate job right now. There's no way. And I was teaching tennis on the side, uh, to support college. And I was like, I'm just going to throw my hand at this and start teaching, build up a client base. And I did that for a long time and, um, really enjoyed it, loved it, loved meeting people, um, loved helping them succeed in tennis. Uh, but that gave me an opportunity because I had a lot of spare time, you know, I teach a lesson in the morning or in the afternoon or whenever. And so I dabbled in a lot of different things. So uh, this is probably a common story. You know, I did some affiliate marketing. I was flipping products. Uh, I was just looking for a way to what I thought at the time was going to be just start a side hustle. Just how can I bring in some more cash? I had no ambitions of, of really making anything big of it, but, um, Around 2014, I got uh, introduced to the Amazon FBA model. And the more I dove in, it started really blowing my mind. I'm like, wow, I mean, I you can create a real brand and you can almost be a one-person show and build something big. Uh, so I went all in. Uh, I launched my first product in 2014. I had uh, two young boys at the time. Um, so they were helping me label products and we'd have a kind of like a little assembly line going. Um, and that first product took off. Uh, and I was following a podcast. I don't know if you, um, there was this, um, podcast called the amazing seller it was Scott Volker. Yeah. And I listened every day. Uh, and I, he was like, do this, you know, you go, you know, look at all the reviewers on Amazon. I mean, of course, this is way back in the day, uh, when you could do basically anything. And, uh, so I just, I would, it would be like doing dishes or whatever and listening to his podcast and then go implement. And, uh, that first product took off and uh, i remember i mean you know where you're just like scrolling and like every day you're like you know every five minutes you're refreshing your app to see how many sales you made um i couldn't believe it um you know and it it took off and i was like wow okay there's something to this this business um and so i just continued to launch more and more products and that was in 2014 when I started, uh, by 2017, um, was easily making more money, um, uh, than my tennis teaching job. And I've talked to my wife and we're like, well, I think it's time to like throw all the chips in and, and go even more full throttle. So we, uh, packed up, moved, I'm from Kansas city. So I moved back to Kansas city, um, quit my teaching job and just started Amazon FBA full time. Um, and it continued to do, um, really well. And it's, it's been a real super fun journey. Uh, a part of that though, I know it sounds great, but there's, you know, good to talk about the ups and downs also, but, um, I was in a pretty, um, the, the niche was pretty commoditized. I, I started off in the fitness niche. So I had a lot of fitness products. Um, and there wasn't a lot of, uh, like differentiation. I just happened to be sort of like first to the market, um, uh, back in 2014 and as it grew, competition grew, uh, I had to do a lot of pivoting, uh, a lot of adjustments and, and around about a year and a half or so after I quit my job, um, sales really started to like level off and I was going to get a little panicky when you go all in, um, it becomes real. You're like, I'm supporting my family with this. I can't make any mistakes. <laughs> um, and. It just got more saturated. Uh, a lot of competition came in, uh, cost per clicks for advertising went up and it started to really go on the start trending down. And I had to have a real 
heart to heart with myself. It's like, okay, I know I went all in. And what was funny was I was starting to talk about my business a lot then too. So I kind of had a lot like emotionally riding on it. My friends and family knew, you know, they, they saw I was starting to really succeed. They didn't really understand what I was doing. And then I saw, saw it starting to slide and that kind of put me in a, I was a little panicked. Um, but I was like, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start teaching tennis again. Uh, I'm going to bring in money to support myself and I'm going to figure out a way to, to reverse this, to get this going again. Um, and it did. And it started, you know, I started differentiating products a little bit more. I went outside of the fitness line. Um, and then incidentally, I was a part of, um, a local meetup in Kansas city here of Amazon sellers. And I didn't know it at the time, but it was put on by this company called Solozo, um, who's based, who was based out of Kansas city. They were, um, an Amazon advertising tech company and they reached out and they're like, do you want to work with us? Uh, I was like, yes, that would be awesome. I would love to, to work with you. So I, I went on with them and that really springboarded my journey, uh, because I was now every day involved with sellers, talking to sellers, uh, Chris, who you had on the podcast, uh, not too long ago was my colleague. And we decided to start a podcast. We started talking to other industry experts like yourself, uh, on a daily basis. And my knowledge base grew, my contacts grew. Am I going too long on my story here, <laughs> Reggie? Oh, yeah. uh, so, and that made me realize I had made a big mistake early on, and that was being too isolated. Mm. I was, I, and knowing that now, going back, I would have been up to speed on the competition coming in. I would have been up to speed on, hey, I need to differentiate more. I need to be looking at new opportunities and constantly launching new products, not, not living off of what at that time was, I had a hero product that was, you know, 80% of my sales and it just kept going up and up and up. And I just started getting a little comfortable with that up and up and up. Like I, I can just ride with this. Um, but yeah, I bet reality came crashing down quickly. Um, and so being a part of Solozo, talking to sellers, having the podcast, I started getting, you know, more knowledge, more exposure to people that could help, which is so great about this industry is all the people, you know, the more resources that you have, the bigger your network is, the more you, uh, you can continue to grow. Um, and so I branched off in a couple of directions. I still have my, my private label, um, still, still rolling with that and still looking to continue to grow that. I actually started, uh, an online arbitrage business as well. Uh, we had a, uh, a couple of guests on our podcast that were talking about online arbitrage and like, you know, that's kind of how I started. I would flip a few things and, you know, I learned Amazon. I recommend anybody who's getting, looking into this business. You should, if you want to understand a little Amazon, a little better, just go to a store, you get out the app, try to find some products to flip. Even if it's not profitable, you're going to learn a ton about the process and what to do. Um, and, but it got me thinking and all these people I was talking to were having success with online arbitrage. And so about eight months ago, I started a whole separate, uh, account for online arbitrage and I've been growing that now I'm, uh, working with, uh, uh, a three PL that handles all of, uh, the packing and the shipping into FBA. So I can just order online and send it to them and they handle the rest. That's a whole nother aspect of Amazon. That's totally different. You know, you're worried more about winning the buy box and repricing and, you know, finding the voids in the market. That's been really fun. Um, and around the same time also, uh, I met, uh, I met through actually through tennis. Tennis has been great also for networking with me. Um, uh, I met a guy who's, uh, been selling direct in, in retail stores. He's got a, a fairly large business, uh, in Kansas city. He's been selling direct to retailers, uh, forever. And he approached me about. Uh, he knew what I was doing on Amazon. He approached me about, Hey, can we partner and start selling a lot of these products on Amazon? So we partnered up, uh, created a company and now, you know, there's a resource there where he has access to all these factories and access to, uh, to very large orders since he's ordering for retailers as well. Uh, and so we're growing that line of, uh, business selling on Amazon. And that's been a ton of fun. I've really been able to implement a lot of the strategies and things I've learned throughout my career doing this, 
uh, and really grow that. So, and I, I'm always looking for the, the next opportunity. You know, I love to try to grow things and scale things and build teams and then continue to expand. Cause I, I think that's what's fascinating about the space is the opportunity comes every day. So that's a little bit about my a story. We can uh, <laughs> go on from there. I would say that this is probably the longest introduction I've had for the podcast. Uh, so sorry. I mean, I, I'm only really like, what, like seven episodes in. So uh, I loved it, to be honest. I, I, I love that pod. I love that intro. Um, it gives me, literally, I have a whole half page of notes of things I wanted to talk about as you started saying that. Uh, I Looking back at what I just wrote down, I'm seeing like one major theme of networking and mm -hmm. uh, network through tennis networking in your local meetup uh, networking now in your podcast so i how important it is to be networking i always hated networking i i, I think to this day i still kind of am uncomfortable with it but mm -hmm. the reality is how powerful networking is 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 absolutely understated and i think people don't focus on it enough uh, it makes me think of specifically you ended up basically getting a job or partnering with Salozo from a local networking event by leveraging what you were already trying to do and already successful at, but had to make it work. So I, I think all these things just crossed my mind again. The first one being the first biggest one was like the financial pressure to put food on the table for a family. Mm -hmm. I can imagine stressful that is as a, an Amazon seller, leaving everything behind kind of on, on the upswing and then having the business kind of like, you know, oscillate more than it should and mm -hmm. having to like it work. So one, dealing with that pressure as an entrepreneur and then pushing past that must have been extremely challenging and probably very courageous of you just to, as an entrepreneur, to just to make it work and relying back on your experience to, to one network and then build out different offshoots, different uh, income streams. But just by networking and going to a, a, a local meetup, next thing you know, you're an account executive at mm -hmm. Salozo, thinking about things that you love, networking even further and building out streams of income even further. So I thought that was extremely interesting. My, one honest question I wanted to know is like, was one of your first products something related to tennis? No. Well, loosely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. now, it was actually resistance bands. So workout oh. resistance bands was my first product. Um, I still sell it. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's not a winner anymore. It just kind of hangs on and does a little bit Fun. here and there. It's super, uh, it's super saturated. Uh, anybody who wants to go see a saturated niche, go look up resistance bands and then scroll for two hours and you'll still see the same <laughs> resistance band on page 100, as you saw on page one, uh, which makes it tough. But, um, you know, the a reason for that at the time was I didn't have a ton of capital. They were relatively inexpensive. I could order, you know, thousands of them for a couple thousand dollars, not, you know, massive amounts of money. I wasn't, I wasn't at the point where I was ready to like, you know, destroy my savings account on a risk. Uh, right. I wanted to learn. Um, but those were selling, I mean, I, I had days where I was selling like 400, 500 units a day. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. Um, you know, it just, it opened my, my eyes to everything. Um, but at the same time, you know, you're talking about like $3 profit per unit. It wasn't like 10, 15, $20 profit per unit. Uh, so the volume made up for that. I still think there's a lot of opportunity in low price, high volume products for sure. Um, but once it start, what, what I failed to predict or prepare for was if I have to lower my price a couple bucks, there goes all of my profit. You know, if I have to compete on price, which in a lot of saturated niches, you, that's your, basically the only lever you have to pull, uh, is price point. And so that, that's where it really started to, to shrink, uh, what I was bringing in. And yeah, that, that I'll never forget that feeling. I was like, I remember waking up one day, I was like, I don't think we're going to have enough money coming in to support the lifestyle that we've now created. And I've got to get creative and I got to get creative really fast. And that was, uh, yeah, it's 
I don't know. It just, it's for me, I'm fairly prideful, uh, person. And I was telling people, you know, I was like, I was telling my family, telling my friends, like, look, this is, I was trying to encourage others to do it. Um, and so in the back of your mind, you're like, oh no, if this fails, it's kind of, it's a hit personally, not just business. And then of course, trying to rebound and take care of the family, but it all works out. Yeah. I, I, what I then realized is I had, you know, I could make it not fail. Number one, I can prevent that from happening, you know? And also what I realized is even if it did fail, I just trained myself in an industry that people need this, these skill sets. There's thousands of businesses that are looking for these specific skill sets. And I still feel like this industry, uh, doesn't have enough talent to support the needs. And so there's tons of opportunity. So, and you never know where your life's going to go. <laughs> thousand percent. Right. It, exactly. I ask myself like literally like every six months, did I would ever expect that I would be here? And the answer is no. Um, and then to kind of like piggyback off what you're saying, when we build a skill set in the most competitive uh, marketplace in the world, Amazon.com, you're going to, you're going to sharpen your, 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 your tool set. And mm. to kind of go back to the networking thing. I went to a mastermind years ago, um, paid $10,000 for it. It was a complete waste of money. Uh, absolute complete money uh from the in terms of the knowledge that i got you know i went there paid the 10 grand and then i was like when i was done and i really like incorporated what i learned to ask myself uh, i didn't really probably need to spend 10 grand on this but what was crazy is what ended up working out after that like a year and a half after that i had met a a couple at that event that had a pet supplement company and they remembered me asking very like in-depth questions. We ended up getting lunch together and six months before I left the military, they asked me to, they asked me, Hey, when you get out of the military, we would love to bring you on, run our team. Uh, we'll cut you in a percent of equity and pay you a salary. And I was like, this sounds great. You know, I had like about six months, again, like six months left of my contract. So I said, Hey, let's do it. Like not, I can even do it now, you know, cause I eat, sleep and breathe Amazon at that time outside of my nine to five. Uh, they ended up selling for, I think a little over 3 million, but it was an interesting opportunity just to be provided that just from a networking event. And then on top of that, from that same networking event, I met someone and I, I only had like half a conversation with him and we ended up keeping in touch over like a period of four or five years on, um, on Facebook messenger. And when I sold my business about like eight, six months later, he reaches out to me and he's like, Hey, like how are things going? And I'm like, oh, I just sold my business for you know six hundred thirty eight thousand. He's like, and I'm like, how are you doing? He's like, excellent. You know, I just sold for twenty one million. <laughs> what? I know. what? One million? What? And uh, what was crazy? He's like, yeah, you know, I'm working for this aggregator now, uh, and they really need talent. They need a lot of help, and um, I want to recommend you to to work with them. And uh, so I was offered a a very very lucrative full-time position with equity uh, at one of these aggregators. Uh, unfortunately, I decided after a short period that the fit wasn't for me, um, but just networking alone provides you the opportunity uh, to build those, you know, it gives you the opportunity to get, to open more doors. And I think it, it's just as true as for me as it has been for you. Um, and, you know, a lot of these parallel stories that you have, you know, coming to success and then still doing with failure and pushing past that and having to make things work, uh, make sure that, that you can pay the bills at the end of the day is, is, is a very real thing. And, um, I think it's something that a lot of entrepreneurs don't talk enough about in terms mm -hmm. of what I think a lot of people think that well, as soon as we start making money, that it's just, we either have that as a consistent floor or that it starts to, you know, everyone scales up and then everything is just gr like good to go. Right. And there's, I know there's a lot of influencers out there in the space too, that, um, have either built their businesses, uh, got them semi profitable. And then all of a sudden they, they, they run that revenue through, through a business and they scale up their agency, but they're still not operating. And I think, uh, it's, it's very refreshing to be on conversations with people who are literally still in the game like mm -hmm. yourself and for ways to to sharpen their skill set and just 
who enjoy the process, enjoy teaching. Um, and that kind of brings me to my, my next point that I want to talk about, just based off of your story right there, um, was I thought it was, I was a little jealous, to be honest, in a good way, that your first product was a winner. I know. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't so happen. You, often. Yeah. So could you explain like the feelings that you had, um, you know, with that first launch and how it felt? Uh, you know, in the first month or two, just experiencing that kind of revenue growth. Yeah. Um, well, it felt great. That's for sure. Um, you know, I had tried other things in the past and, you know, other, I mean, I tried affiliate marketing and, you know, make a couple hundred bucks a month or something like that. I'm like, ah, oh, this is, you know, I'm just, I not, don't love it that much. And, you know, flipping products is like, this is kind of a grind. Um, it's making extra cash, but it takes time. Uh, but when those sales started coming in and it, it happened relatively quickly, I mean, it was just a couple of months and it was like number one ranked product, bestseller selling like crazy. I was, I was shocked. I mean, I, you, your mind starts going, you know, you're like, okay, this is, this is going to work. I can do this. I love this business model. Um, you know, my family was all excited, um, you know, my kids were involved. That's one thing I've always wanted to do is keep my kids involved in any of these entrepreneur things. I want them to understand that they can take care of themselves no matter what, and they can always find a way. Uh, but on the flip side, it was a negative, uh, in a lot of ways because it was, it seemed too easy, uh, because that first one was a success. Um, I, another mistake that I made was. I then started, I was like, well, if this one does this, why don't I just keep launching products all the time? You know? And so my goal was just to get products out, products out, products out. And I started to realize, Hey, like one out of four of these is working, you know, you know, they, and every time I would do that, like one out of four and all those launches were, were costing me a lot of my profits that I was making on this, the original product or the other ones that were starting to succeed. And so I really had to refine my approach, you know, to, it's not just about launching, launching. We got to, let's, let's dive in. Let's focus on making the ones that are working. How can I make them better? Let's focus on my product research. How can I better ensure that the launches are, uh, successful? Um, so in, in some ways, the early success kind of didn't, it, it was almost like a, it was false. Like it's, you know, it gave me it was a false sense of reality of what it was like. Um, the other thing that was a false sense of reality was the marketplace in itself. Like anyone who launched in 2014 knows what I'm talking about. It, it was different. It was way easier. You, you could do all kinds of what would be completely black hat things. Now they were taught they, you know, there were people who were telling you to do these things. Um, so, you know, you really, once you start to see that, it's like, okay, I need to treat this. This is not a side hustle. This is a business. I need to learn every single aspect of it. And that's what I started doing, just trying to apply it. And that's where the networking later on was, was huge for sure. Yeah, definitely. Um, again, as you talk, 12 things pop in my head, but, uh, I'm thinking of what the landscape was. So I got into Amazon and late 2015 i was high ticket drop in drop shipping early 2015 but i remember when i got into this space you know i was going like same thing listening to the same podcast probably taking the exact same courses you were um and the narrative was launch 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 you know like just just get it out get it out there and my first product was a shower head and a lot of the courses at the time were saying just get it out there even to the point where it was like don't even bother making a box like designing a box like right. put it in a white box, sh shove it in there and see what sticks. And, um, I was able to do, you know, I pulled out all the tricks of all the courses that I had learned, you know, a good amount of them were black hat. You know, I got 40 friends and family to leave a review within two days. Um, in, in the shower head niche, which is an absolute beast of a niche. Mm -hmm. And, um, it did really well until I got shut down with a patent infringement. Um, been there too. Like, we can talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, all these parallel stories, I think, you know, that Amazon sellers go through, but entrepreneurs in, in general go through. And it makes me think too, right, right before we hopped on the show, uh, we were briefly discussing mindset. And um, one thing I love talking about is business travel and mindset. And sometimes when I 
when I talk about it with other people, some people will really dive into like, oh, you know, um, this habit or this tactic or this, whatever it is. And uh, I liked that you, you know, sometimes people don't aren't all about it, but you don't have to be all about it to make it work. And you had said things like, you know, we were talking about books that we're reading or what things are people are talking about in the industry. And, and you just went like, it's the same. You just make it work. And uh, so I love that as well. And I want other people to kind of, hear that if you're not motivated or it's not working like you just have to make it work that's like the easiest way to think about it, is you just make it work find a find a freaking way because when you when you have to put food on the table or you have to make that next month's income um there's no way no way else to do it and i remember thinking to myself when i when i was telling people on my nine to five when i was in the military about what i was trying to do i was trying to keep it very secretive actually at first because i didn't want people knowing that a military officer um, who leads people and does all these things um, is off to the side. Um, you know, what everyone thought was like flipping sneakers online. You know, nobody took it seriously. Now everyone's starting to take Amazon seriously. But back then it was like, you know, it was like selling things on Craigslist is kind of what it looked like. Oh, yeah. And uh, being an officer in the military, you're supposed to get things actually approved if you have, quote unquote, a side time, side, side job. I actually never even got it approved. I, I looked at like the, the regulations and I saw how, how much of a gray hat area it was or a gray area it was. I even called up like the legal counsel and um, inquired and I could tell based off their response, they had no idea um, a job versus uh, entrepreneurial like side gig. So I just decided, you know, I'm just going to go ahead and do this thing. And um, I remember other people were starting to get interested in it when I started making money, I didn't tell me much people when I started making a few thousand dollars a month. I, I was always talking about what I was working on, what I was doing. People loved uh, hearing about it primarily because we had an hour and a half drive out to uh, the missile field where I would work. So we, you get to know people really well, their families, mm-hmm. their sto- struggles, um, and you know, the, the stories of, of, of people's lives and those who wanted to find something different to do, they were always interested in what I was doing. And there was a few that for sure were interested in Amazon, uh, but the, their response was always, yeah, but I have a family and I have kids and I, you know, I, I don't have a family or kids that I directly support, uh, support. Um, so I, I know for me, that decision has been easier, uh, but it is very refreshing to see someone like you who has a family um, and still decide to take that huge step, no, knowing all that, but you did it in a smart way, right? You, you didn't just, make some money and then quit your job. Right. And uh, when you started making money, you still had to make it work. And you didn't have to possibly do all these other things that, that other people have to do to, to ground and to make it work. But you networked, you leveraged your skill set, uh, and, and you made it work. So I, I think that's, it should be very motivating for someone who, who doesn't want to, who's really scared to leave it all behind. Because the reality is, like you said, you can, you can always go back and do what you're doing before. Um, but this time you'll go back. If you do go back, you'll go back as well a person with a, a broader perspective and you'll probably, to be honest, I don't know anyone that's failed and went back to the same thing. Like I, I met other sellers who, who joined around the same time I did um, and who actually decided to leave Amazon early, who I guess you could say failed, even though they didn't fail there. They were, they did, they went and did different things. They never went back to what they were doing before. And I see that as expansion. I see that as, as changing things up in your life, because if you're going back to something that you didn't like before, um, and to me, that's more of a fear-based decision. And um, you probably are interested in this lifestyle because something about it, out, maybe out, you know, a lot of people who love business, love business. We love systems. We love creating things. But I think for a lot of people as well, there's some kind of pain or some kind of um, growth that we want to experience. And, and you know, selling things online and being an entrepreneur allows us to to learn those things in which we can leverage not just making a product and selling it on Amazon, but uh, creating a stronger resume and just creating that externality to uh, create more opportunities in my life. Absolutely. I mean, I can touch on a little more of that. Just I mean, I'm lucky in the fact that I've got a very supportive wife. I mean, she knows me really well. She knows my mentality. I've always been uh, an experimenter. I do have a very high risk tolerance. Um, you know, I'm not really... Uh, like I'm okay with failing at things. Um, I don't know where that comes from. I just am a lot, a lot of my 
rest of my family is not like that. Um, you know, and then when I made that decision to quit and go full-time Amazon, uh, there was pushback in my, you know, it's like people were like, are you sure that's a good idea? Are you sure that you're, you've created this, you know, this great tennis business, uh, secure, you know, you've got, uh, benefits, you've got all these things and it's benefits, like, they... yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, I know, but I, I, I feel like I can do this. And my wife was super supportive. Um, she was very supportive, uh, you know, even when things, uh, looked like they might go south a little bit, you know, that's another thing is you create a lifestyle and you want that to continue. <laughs> it's, it's never fun to pull things back, you know, and get it, you know, get a different car or anything like that. Um, but if, you know, that comes to mindset, I knew I could do it. And what's, what's interesting is temporarily when I got back into, uh, teaching tennis just to make sure that I had cash community while I was figuring other things out. I took a lot of what I'd learned and in, into that, you know, I was able to network. I, I was charging way more than I used to charge. Uh, you know, when I was doing it full time, I was really specific about the clients that I would work with. Um, you know, I was able to, I was able to expand. I was doing a lot more group stuff, which brought in more money. Um, so I, mean, I, I learned a lot, you know, and I actually did that better. Um, you know, the second time and, and, I still do it every once in a while. I mean, I have a few clients that I work with. I love teaching tennis. And I still do it and I've got time to do it and it's, it's fun, but yeah, the, the mindset I think is different for everybody. You know, I think some people yeah. are, yeah. are wired um, and it's probably not a good idea for them to be an entrepreneur. They're wired for security, safety. Uh, you know, I, I'm getting this much every month. <laughs> I, I know what I'm getting. I get the salary and for them, that's great. Uh, for me, it's, and I say this I, ironically, cause I do have a, a salary job with Solozo that I, but it doesn't feel like it, you know, it's in my niche and that's, it still feels entrepreneurial. So, you know, I'm helping people with their business and it's a lot of fun. Um, but mindset's just key to all that. You, you've got to orient yourself to your mindset it's not entrepreneurship it's not for everybody uh but it's also if it is for you a salary job can can be kind of a prison you know and you can escape it so yeah definitely um again now i'm thinking about all kinds of things i want to bring it back to a few things the first one is like support and um that makes me think first of all we have to be okay with failing we have to be okay with starting over. We have to be okay with our pride being hurt, not just our wallets. And mm -hmm. um, those who I think, you know, can learn from failure, it re like it really, it sounds so freaking lame, but like it really ends up not becoming a failure. It only becomes a failure if you absolutely, if you absolutely quit, not just quit the business model, but like quit that process of learning and quit that process of taking lessons learned from tennis and putting it into business or vice versa. And um, then we go to support and, Support from one person, at least for me, it meant everything. And I would imagine like having a wife, it means everything. And it can also mean, it can also be extremely damaging. Um, if you have someone near you or in, in your orbit that, that doesn't support you, that makes you feel small. Um, and I think sometimes if people are listening and they're thinking about this, um, it's important to, to not let fear get in the way to, to really trust how you feel. And I actually wrote it down. It's what you said this, you said, you feel like you can do it. And to me, that, that makes me feel like that you tapped into like the deepest part of yourself. And it wasn't a calculation that you made. It wasn't, you know, obviously the, the rationale is there, but you intuitively felt like you could do it. And you had someone super supportive there with you and you were able to, to fail and push forward. So I think it's, it can be very toxic to be around people who, who make you feel small and it can, it can be as, sometimes as small as a comment or you know or mm -hmm. just a small conversation i realize stops a lot of people from moving forward um with their life with whatever they're pursuing so i think it's really important to to recognize when people are, are telling you things out of fear telling you things out of um, out of their own jealousy or uh, because they haven't done it themselves or because they've done some version of that and we we give too much like expertise credit to that person. And the, I think the one 
one good example was like Grant Cardone. I was watching one of his webinars like three, four years ago, and he was telling people like, why does everyone keep listening to their parents when it comes to buying a house? Like why? Just because they bought a house doesn't mean they're, they're going to make millions in real estate. It's like, I made millions in real estate. Don't listen to them unless you want to be like them when it, term, when it comes to real estate, you know, listen to someone else who's actually doing it. So um, you're not going to hear that kind of advice when it comes to entrepreneurship from non-entrepreneurs. So if you want to be a non-entrepreneur, go and listen to people who are non-entrepreneurs, but you should probably one realize what kind of decision you're making. Is it fear-based or is it intuition and passion-based? Is it like, does it light you up? Does it, obviously things are hard and stressful. Uh, everything is, but does it light you up at the end of the day? And I think you were able to um, really feel into that and, um, and kind of pull that out in, in a great supportive network. So I want to kind of talk about that. And um, I wrote down marketing. I don't know why. Marketing. <laughs> um, that I, I totally forgot. But um, yeah. So, w- what do you think about about what I just said there? Did, does that ring true with with your experience about how, how you went through that? Yeah, very much so. Yeah, I mean, t- in terms of support, yeah, having uh, having my wife support that. I mean, I think about that a lot. You know, they, I if if you're with if your partner has uh, a mentality that could be a little different than yours. Uh, they're looking for security. Uh, entrepreneur is not who you want to, uh, to be around <laughs> probably if you're looking for, uh, security or things not, not changing every uh, five minutes. Um, but my wife is super supportive. She's an entrepreneur herself. I mean, she's an artist. Uh, so she's, she knows, you know, what it's like. I mean, if, if she's not selling art or not doing anything, I mean, the, then m- money doesn't come in. And it was the same thing, uh, with both tennis and, uh, business for me. Um, so having that support was huge. Um, you know, but I think that goes to trying to find the right partner. I knew she was the right partner for me, uh, or dating. Cause we just saw the world the same way. You know, we wanted to travel. We wanted to, you know, not be necessarily chained to a location or chained to a job. So we had the right, the same values. Um, and if you have those same values, then you understand the flip side of that, you know, what, you know, if it doesn't work temporarily, (laughs) you might be stuck in a location for a little while or something like that. Um, so that support has been, been huge. Um, as my kids get older, they're super enthusiastic about, um, everything that, that we're doing. They, they like to listen in and be involved. And so they can be, um, supportive as well. Um, but I think experience also can be a supporter to yourself. You know, you're, um, if you start like with, with tennis is a perfect example. Um, if I don't have lessons scheduled, I make no money. Uh, you know, so it's pretty simple. Uh, and then there can be all kinds of, uh, outside factors. If you don't work at a club that has indoor courts, the, it can rain for a week and that's not your fault, you know, but, but how do you respond to that to keep the, uh, the revenue the same, you know, you just got to do more when it's better weather and create more revenue, build group classes. Um, so, you know, you, but having gone through that, all of my sort of like formative years as a young adult, um, that really helped prepare me for ups and downs. You know, you've got great months, bad months, you know, you're always trying to figure out ways to do so that I knew that was going to be the case. And I, I knew that I could make a lot of things work. And and now, now that I have multiple skill sets, you know, like you can, you can teach tennis lessons, you can sell on Amazon, you can work, work for uh, great companies like Salozo and create business partners. Uh, it just comes, comes down to keeping that network for sure. Yeah. I think you, have, you definitely have a lot of options open and you can pivot so many different ways. And it, to kind of go back to a little bit what you said about you know, having your kids be involved in the process of your business. I can't imagine what that does to a child seeing their parents, you know, from an entrepreneurial perspective, take risks and build things and, and, and be creative about, about them. So I would imagine that you're an excellent role model um, for, for your, your children and, and you're probably, I would imagine, really building up their confidence and their ability to push past failure and to just take leaps. And I can't imagine, um, 
all the effects that come. It's just another positive effect. I see it as being an entrepreneur and being um, a role model. Uh, you have a partner that supports you. Like I would imagine that your children see that. And when they talk to their friends and they're like, you know, I would imagine that they're doing like, oh, my dad doesn't do that or my mom doesn't do that. And it's not to hate on anyone's parents who don't do that, right? But to, to have that kind of foundation early on in your life, I think, um, you know, Gary Vee talks about it a lot too. He always attributes a lot of his business acumen, not to a degree that he got, not to whatever it was. It was, it was about being built up around uh, a supportive environment around someone who, who basically said you're the best person in the world to handle all this stuff. Like you can do it all. You can do it all. So um, I think a, a supportive environment is, is truly important for, for anything, whether it's from a tactical level on, you know, how am I going to set up my workstation? How am I going to leverage the good days and the bad days all the way down to, you know, how do we live our life and, and uh, how do we support the people around us? Uh, I hope that's cool. the case. I hope that's, I try. <laughs> I'm not perfect in terms of that, but I try. And it, it is fun to see them that I feel like they have a little bit of a different understanding of what's possible, um, what they can do. So I, I do hope that's the case, but they enjoy it. They have a good attitude about, about everything. And they've got their own little side businesses they're trying to start all the time. I'm like, yes, it's a great idea. <laughs> you know, it's not going to work, but go try it. Uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. But they're like, refresh their Amazon account or their TikTok page or something like that. And so yeah. well, my, oh. you know, my oldest son, when he was, uh, I mean, he was probably in like fourth or fifth grade at the time. Uh, I was right after he moved here. Um, after, after Halloween, we, we had just so much candy and then in like four days it was gone. And I was like, my wife and I were like, you guys cannot eat that much candy. He's like, I'm not eating it. Oh, what are you doing? He's like, I'm selling them for a dollar on the school bus. And I'm like, how much have you made? He's like, it's like, I don't know, 175 bucks. I'm like, what? Okay. And uh, I was like, okay, that's great. And then like two weeks later, it's like, we get an email from the school. It's like, you cannot be selling stuff on the bus. I'm like, well, that was a great, uh, great shot. And you know, that was his little first uh, foray into entrepreneurism. But uh, I love so. that. That's one that, that makes me think, um, it goes right back to that story. It's like, I think you're, just by being you and following what you quote, what you feel you can do is showing your kids that they can think outside of the, the box at such a young age. So they're going to, I think they're going to take that pattern, that, that way of thinking into their, into their entire way of life. And I think uh, those, I think that is absolutely invaluable. And that also makes you think of a similar story when I was a kid, um, didn't have much money growing up and uh, we, my school was like the only school on, on the island in Hawaii that would finance a trip. If you took French, which is why I decided to take French, if you took French your junior, senior year, the, the French teacher would get us to go to France and it would be like a whole thing. We have to fundraise for forever. Um, and then eventually we would go. So I think we fundraised for like a year or two, but we were selling candy. We had like these box candies, like a school approved program. So they give us like a, like an actual box that we were allowed to carry around the school and it had like m and it. it was like this really cool cardboard box so but when the fundraiser was done i just i rarely went back to walmart and bought a bunch of candy stocked <laughs> it back up on it for months afterwards and afterwards the french teacher was like yeah we've been back we we're already back from france like why do you still have this and then eventually <laughs> i had to stop doing it but i was also the same thing i was selling candy um yep at school and then eventually got shut down doing it. But uh, I love it. You learned. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely learned. I, I had one question too. Um, so you have a, you have a background in finance and you also have an MBA. Um, I was curious as to your thoughts on how did that, how did that translate over into entrepreneurship? Um, what kind of value did that bring for better and for worse? Yeah, this is a great question. We could talk all day about this question. Um, you know, I've, when I was in high school and everything, I mean, school sort of came easy to me. I mean, I, I get decent grades. Uh, I don't know if I can remember stuff or, or why. Um, but you know, I, I went to college because I was I wanted to play tennis. So I mean, I, that was, that was why 
that was my main goal. Um, and then I did, I loved business. So I got a finance degree. Um, and then after school's over, or at least that my undergrad college was over, I was teaching tennis basically full time at that point, And I did my MBA at night and really, I honestly can remember this. I mean, I just, I feel like I did it. So I could say, I could say I did it. I feel like, and that was, you know, that was back in the early two thousands. And at that point, a college degree really did mean something. Uh, um, you know, it, you know, if you got an MBA, you were definitely going to get a better starting job, um, you know, at a bank or wherever. And I had no interest at, at all in that. Um, but in terms of what it did for, for me is other than learning the lingo, you know, it's like, you know, I could, I, I understood a little bit about stock market. That was great. That came from, uh, that was sort of a focus in my undergrad in the MBA. And I, so I, I knew the terminology and I knew like balance sheets and profit loss statements and, you know, so I could talk the talk and I, and, and then when you start an, an Amazon business and I thought you're very focused on those things, you're looking at balance sheets and profit loss statements and your profits and margins. And what do those mean? So I think from that perspective, it was helpful, but I also think I could have learned that in a day watching a YouTube video. Yeah, definitely. it's, it's not ultra complicated. Um, and it was very expensive. Um, and also none of the things that actually propelled my business or my desire or my entrepreneurial spirit or any of that was learned anywhere in school. It was all just learned by just trying and doing stuff. I mean, I'll tell you what they, I, what I never learned is how to run PPC campaigns, uh, in a, in a college class or, you know, social media marketing. There wasn't social media, you know, there it's so, I mean, all the things that are really impactful in my business, I, I just don't really credit that to college. Um, and I, I think I'd be in the same spot, honestly, um, potentially sooner. <laughs> Uh, than, than that. And so we, that's actually a conversation my wife and I have all the time about our kids, you know, it's like, you know, there's still a stigma on, you know, if you don't have a college degree or that, and I don't know where that stigma comes from. It comes, you know, friends, family, people, I mean, you, you talk to people and there's like, but then you look around and you're like, hmm, a huge majority of these successful people, including the Uber rich, never finished college. Um, they just found their passion and they went after it. And so we have a lot of conversations about that. Like, are, are we going to be the family that's left, like, you know, you have to get a college degree because you have to, um, or are we going to be like, look, if, you know, maybe, maybe four years of, of working in a field that you really want to might be more beneficial. So I think that whole scope is changing, uh, across, I mean, I, I don't think that businesses today put a lot of stock in a fat piece of paper. I think they like, you know, I think some do, I think some old school traditional businesses still do. Um, but I don't think it is an indicator of the quality of employee that you're going to get by any means. I would hire 100% today, somebody who is scrappy and figured a whole bunch of stuff out over somebody that has, you know, a nice shiny college degree without those skills. Definitely. Um, brings back again, your story parallels similar with mine. So my degree was business management from the Air Force Academy. And when I got into that school and got into that degree, I was thinking to myself like, okay, I'm definitely interested in this stuff. My favorite class was corporate finance. Uh, I love every aspect of my degree in terms of what I was learning about. I felt like it was a very creative thing. I studied Amazon as my final capstone project, my, my final year in university. So I, I was learning everything about Amazon and never even realizing that I'd become an Amazon seller one day. Um, but soon after I graduated and became a nuclear missiles officer, I still wanted to be like an investment banker and do all these kind of, uh, cool things and, and uh, in the p private equity type space, like well, most of my friends who graduated from there uh, wanted to do, and some are doing now. And I was trying to find a path towards a high quality remote MBA, um, but it didn't really exist that well. So 
I was kind of like, okay, what I can do is I'll do a master's of science in finance. Um, I can do that for like 10 to 15, 20 K. Um, and then I'll run a business off to the side. And that's when I started selling like my iPhone six phone cases. And, um, I lost, I think like three, four grand within a period of a few months, like very, very quickly. And, uh, I had taken my masters of science finance class and I could choose like which classes I want to take first. So I was like, okay, I need, I need some motivation here in my day. So I took corporate finance, uh, corporate finance, like 301 or something like that first. And it was literally the exact same material that I had learned about in my undergraduate. And I remember hearing that from people who graduated MBAs from Harvard, Stanford, would come back as alumni and say, hey, your MBA, you've already learned it all. It's literally the same courses, but you're going to get out of, what you're going to get out of an MBA more than anything is a network and prestige. So if you're not going to leverage either of those in today's day and age, it's not going to be that beneficial. So it was really hard for me um, where I was currently stationed at the time and what was available online with my work schedule. It was really hard. And on top of that, I'm really bad at standardized tests. I took I studied for like a year and a half for the GMAT and I scored way below the standard deviation. It was like, I never studied so something and failed so bad at it. Um, so I actually got my test results back the same month that I failed like a $4,000 first entrepreneurship, like source mm-hmm. of Ollie bottle, you know, course type of game, uh, not even doing drop shipping at that point. And then I, in my first course for my corporate finance class, the class that I loved in my undergraduate, loved it. And I just hated it for some reason, like the material didn't ring with me anymore. And I realized what I was, what I had done is I narrowed down my focus from like, I love business to like my obsession or like, pa- like true passion for entrepreneurship and being uh, like a creative problem solver in, in, in the business that I, that I want to pursue at the time. And um, for me, that was, that's when the feeling started happening. Uh, before then, everything I had done in my life at that point was like, join the military because X, Y, and Z, because it was more like a, more of a mental decision, nothing. And then go to the air force Academy because, you know, then I'll become an officer and I'll, you know, significantly increase my paycheck. It'd be like this huge jump from where I was before. And, um, there was a little bit of like feeling in there, but the first real deep feeling, the first hard pivot I made was I knew at that moment when I decided to cancel my finance, my master's, um, classes, um, after just failing all these things, I knew if I was going to do this way, it was going to be a hard pivot. So I had to think, really think hard for a few months. And, and to be honest, it was just weird because I'm the most spreadsheet person you'd ever meet. Like my product research sheet is absolutely intense with the formulas that I'm running and all kinds of stuff. Um, but when I made this decision, this decision, it really came from like a, a, a deep feeling, like a, you know, a heart, heart space more than a mind space. Uh, and I'm really glad that I leaned into the fear um, and that I had a few people around me that were supportive. Most people who, who were not supportive, I just chalked it up as they didn't understand and they were focused in, in their, their, their way of thinking, their mindset, um, because it can be a lot of group think for people who are trying to do things online. It's like we, we step away from our computer and we enter like this other world where people act and think differently. Um, mm-hmm. So for me, really important to have like one or two people uh, that I connected with that were supportive with what I want to do. Even if they didn't fully understand what I was doing, they understood why I wanted to do something and they understood uh, my end goal. So that for me was absolutely critical. Um, and it, it came really, it, I really came to some dark times um, with myself, like all this, these stories that I always talk about, they were really within a period of six months. I'd said mm-hmm. goodbye to first girl I ever said I love you too. I spent ten thousand dollars on a mastermind that ended up not working out at all in terms of knowledge. I launched a showerhead on Amazon, get to, you know, uh, number one bestseller with the first month to get a patent infringement on, on a BS patent infringement. Honestly, it's an absolute BS patent infringement. Like all these things were a hard pivot and having conversations with family about why after going through a military university, I want to, and then going to a master's, why I want to throw all that away, make this hard pivot. And then being underground half, half the month with my current job, it was like all it was coming to a, like this, like pressure cooker and it became really hard for me. And I thought to myself, that's when I, for the first time really thought to myself, okay, I'm, I'm making this pivot because it feels right. Like deeply, it feels right. But my strategies on what I'm doing is wrong. 
So that's when I was like, I got to, I got to double down on the knowledge. But beyond that, I got to double down about more quote unquote mindset. And that's when I started like listening. That's when my podcast shifted from how do I do a PPC campaign to I was, I literally, I even have this podcast now. It's reggiong.com forward slash motivation. And it's like a list of all the, all the stuff that got me out of bed and got me past like, it was like, you know, the stuff that lit me up and was like, get to work, get to work, get to work. So um, this is also a soft pitch. I've been starting to do it now. A soft pitch. My, you know, I can see it here. It's my planner that I've been working on. Like I've been working on a system that I feel like saved my life, saved my business, saved my relationships uh, and helped me enjoy the process along the way. Um, and I've been thinking about doing this for years, to be honest, like for years and years and years. Uh, Cause I just been doing it off to the side. It's been like a pillar of how I move my business forward. Um, but I just, I just wanted to quickly bring that up because at the end of the day, I'm, I'm building my foundation off of this, off some of the systems I use in this planner, but not everybody has to do that. Not everyone has to use a planner or do like a, a 10 step checklist when they wake up in the morning, right? Sometimes you just got to tap into quote, what you feel you can do and then just get it done. And, um, so I really love that you like kind of pulled that out. Um, and then doing that around providing for your family. It, to me, it's a, it's a, it's a story that a lot of other entrepreneurs who will be going through similar uh, patterns or stories in their life, I think need to hear one from like, I'm a, a single guy, you know, trying to go out in the world or was a single guy, I'm not single anymore, but was a, trying to go out in the world. And, but you're, and I was going through some of the same, I feel like same stories that you were, but you're a married man with, with children and we're kind of running to the same problems, right? I was, I solved it one way, you solved it another way, but at the end of the day, we both, I, I feel, tapped into what we felt and we made it work. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah. You just get to feel, if you feel it's right and you want to do it, do it. Just <laughs> don't have any fear. It's just jump Simple. up. What yeah. about everyone? Is that? Okay. So yeah, if you could, Dustin, I know we're running short on time here. If you could um, tell us a little bit more about Solozo and uh, what you guys, what you guys do and, and uh, how, how you can help other sellers in the space. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I've talked about how I, how I met with the company, uh, met them at a meetup, um, really loved what they were doing um, and end up joining on with them. Uh, but Solozo is a uh, advertising automation and optimization platform. Um, there's both self-serve where you can use our, our really robust software tool to help manage your campaigns. Um, or, or we also have managed services as well, where our team can have, help craft strategies and, and use the platform to, to get your ads to perform, uh, the best possible, but, um, really cool tool. Anybody wants to come, come see it. You can go to solozo.com and you can schedule a demo. Um, myself and Chris, who you had on, uh, previously, we. Uh, we do a lot of those demos with sellers. Uh, we can show you how the tool works, but I mean, it's essentially uh, automating your strategy with a daily bid adjustment, keyword harvesting uh, through campaign funnels, day parting, all of it, um, which is something for anybody who's, you know, selling on Amazon right, right now and you're spending a lot of time doing a lot of these tasks that can be automated. Um, I mean, PPC, you definitely want to understand it. You want to know what's going on. Um, but a lot of those things, they don't need to be done manually. Um, they can be done automated and you can, you can monitor what's happening and pivot and change. And that's what Filoza really allows you to do. Um, and it's, it's very cost effective. Uh, so anybody interested, come check us out at Solozo.com and we'd love to help you scale up your ads and help take that time off of your plate. That makes me think, and I've been saying it in a lot of uh, interviews and podcasts I've been on. I feel like back in the day, 2014, 2015, even think, I think in 2014, 2015, I don't even know if Amazon ads was out, but I remember if when, when it was out, nobody was talking about it. And the narrative was, it doesn't really work or, or, you know, and I felt like you could having come from a Google ads background before and Google ads had been around way longer than Amazon. So their, their ad platform is, is super mature, right? They could oh, date yeah. party with years ago. And now it's like kind of new and a new hot thing. Um, I felt like years ago, even just a year and a half ago, you could F around and then find out, you know, but now it's mm -hmm. like how expensive it is. You can't. So definitely mm -hmm. educate yourself. You know, I have a course on how to run PPC, but my course teaches 
real fundamentals, how to kind of do it yourself. But the reality is if you want to do it nowadays, you're going to be happy. You're going to have to use software. Like you're going to have to. Um, and if you're doing a thousand things at once and you want to focus on just getting products out there, focus on your differentiation, uh, learn other aspects, it's important to learn the foundation, but you want to be using software and you guys have an excellent software set up run by entrepreneurs who've been in the game, you know, for a really long time providing strategy and that kind of stuff can't be underestimated. A lot of agencies that kind of pop up over the last few years, in my opinion, and haven't even worked at aggregators who are hiring. I've seen the people they hire. I've been on the front end, the back end of PPC calls. So I know what's, I know what's happening behind the scenes and you, we really want to be working with an agency that has sellers uh, mm-hmm. in there because we're going to keep the agency grounded in, in their tactics, their strategy um, and how they go about uh, operations. So, uh, if anyone's interested, definitely check them out. And uh, Dustin, I really appreciate you uh, coming on the show, taking the time to get you know the topics surround a little bit more uh, in depth about your personal life. So I really appreciate that, and hope to have you back on the show soon. Absolutely, thanks, Reggie. Now you're a part of my network. Uh, so I, yeah, it's great. We can talk anytime now. Uh, yeah, thanks so much for having me on. I enjoyed it. Cool. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye.